if you would turn to Luke chapter 12, it is good to have everyone this morning. Just as a reminder, next Wednesday morning, week from today, we will not have the morning class because I'll, I'll be out of town. Uh, we'll start it again on the 23rd, I believe it is, um, that we will have it again. So not next week, but the week after we will. So let's look at Luke chapter 12, and we're going to begin, uh, we're going to look at the first 12 verses of this for today. And um, as Christ begins, or as chapter 12 begins, I should say, there's, uh, there's about five different things, topics, that Christ warns. Uh, most of those are actually for believers, but they're, they're applicable to all people. But uh, there's about five things. We're going to talk about those in a moment, and then we'll talk specifically about verses 1 through 12. But I think it's important that we remember the overall theme of a chapter that we grasp kind of his overall teaching, and then we come back and break that down. So we're going to do that as we begin chapter 12 today. So let's look in verse 1 of chapter 12. It says, In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together, that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetop. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you who, whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more... You are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers of the and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. I want to go ahead and read down uh, through verse 21 just to kind of set the stage for what he continues to talk about. Verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. All right, let's, let's go back, and I, I want to look at the chapter as a whole and uh, kind of talk through, and I'm going to give you the, the answer there to question one, those five items, but we're going to look at them in the verses. Uh, chapter 12 contains at least five warnings from Christ. What are they? The first one is the warning to beware of hypocrisy, which is what we read in verses 1 through 12. And we'd, we'd actually preached about it this past Sunday. Um, hypocrisy is a very dangerous thing in our life, and it's dangerous because it slips in undetected by people on the outside. So when we talk about being held accountable, there's no accountability between, you know, whether it be Don and I or anyone else. There's no accountability because that hypocrisy means I'm putting on this mask or I'm pretending to be someone that I'm really not. But on the outside, that's what you see. 
So God's the only one that sees that hypocrisy. If we quit listening to the Holy Spirit, then that hypocrisy just kind of runs rampant and it's like yeast. It just kind of slowly grows, but it takes over and, and corruption then takes hold of our life. Second thing, verses 13 through 21, which we read, is to beware of covetousness. Now, there's, there's other information to be talked about and studied, and we will do that when we go through those verses. But the overall there of that passage is God is talking about just the covetousness of one's life and, and how when we are blessed, our responsibility is not to save it all for ourselves. But God blesses so that we might also bless others. And, and so there's an importance of us uh, doing that. Thirdly, beware of worrying. And we did not read these, these verses, but verses 22 through 34, uh, Christ talks about not being, and if you have kind of a title in your Bible, it might say do not be anxious there. Uh, he speaks to just how um, we should consider he talks about lilies, and some of you may remember the song from years ago, Consider the Lilies. Um, they don't toil or spin, but they're fed by the master. I don't know if you remember that song or not. But anyway, um, it's an old song, so it's not something new. Okay, But this is the, the scriptural reference for that in verse 27. But Christ points out that, you know, God takes care of, if, if he takes care of the grass of the earth, if he takes care of, of, of individual flowers of the earth and all those kind of things, we have no need to let uh, anxiety overtake us, but we must trust in, in God. So these first three things, and, and the fourth one as well that we'll talk about in a moment, these four things, Christ is really speaking to believers because this is things that after we have accepted Christ should be an understanding within our heart. So like to get someone to understand that they should not covet if they're not a believer in Christ, they don't understand this necessarily. We've been blessed so that we can bless someone else. But if they are a believer, they should understand they've been blessed, but that's not for me to keep. That's for me to, you know, that doesn't mean it's wrong for us to have things. It's not what I mean by that. But, but it's not right for us to just build bigger barns either and, and just hold it back. So, um, so these first three and the fourth one as well, which is found in verses 35 through 53, and it's to beware of carelessness. And uh, he begins speaking about how we should be ready for the return. And um, we'll talk through that when we get to that section, but uh, that again is for those who are believers primarily. You get to the, the last few verses, 54 through 59. And, and there's this thought of being aware of spiritual dullness is what I'm going to call it. And it's basically that, that we just kind of live our life without thinking about God, thinking about uh, the creator of the world. But we just kind of go through life and we just wake up today. And you've heard the saying, they're in a new world every day or every morning. Uh, that's kind of this, this mindset that he's addressing here. It's just that we get up and we just go through the day and we don't think about anything and we give no attention to God at all. And this is a warning for all people, not just for those who are saved, because there should be an awareness, even in those who have not necessarily accepted God at this point, that there's something more to life than just we get up today, we go through today, and we go to bed tonight. And um, so we'll talk about that when we get to that, that section as well. But, but this is Christ's teaching as he's talking to his, not only his apostles, the 12, but he's also talking to this crowd that has gathered around him. So uh, we term it loosely disciples. Some of them were followers of his. Some of them were, were people that were physically following, but not truly believers following him. So let's go back to the beginning of chapter 12, verse 1, and let's look at question 2. Uh, what does it mean to be a hypocrite? Have we ever been one? So we said a moment ago, this hypocrisy is, is putting this mask on. Um, in, if you define hypocrite, in some places you'll see it defined as being an actor. So it's like you step out of a, your own role and you step into another role. Um, it was actually used hundreds of years ago when they had plays in that Roman 
era, and, and they would call them actually a, a, the word that translated hypocrite because it was, it was meaning they were an actor is what it was meaning. They played a different role. And you would also have, they would wear masks a lot of times. Sometimes you would have the same actor that played three different roles in a play, but they would put a different mask on, and, and so that line of thought kind of developed of what this is. But Christ uses it here to define us as uh, living as someone on the outside that we're, we're not on the inside. And so uh, to be a hypocrite means to wear a mask, be an actor. It's to hide who we are. And then that last, have we ever been one? And I'm going to say this. Uh, as bad as we hate to say it, as bad as I hate to say it, but if we can't admit that we've ever been one, then we may need to question whether we really have a relationship with God because we're not being honest with ourselves. Um, sadly to say, all of us at some point and it may be years ago, but at some point we've, we've been a hypocrite. And it may be just in a conversation where we talk about someone and how they shouldn't be living their life that way. And we present ourselves as though we're not living our life that way. But yet inside we have sin that, that God's working on you know, within us and, and we just not addressed it. So sadly we have. And I think this is an important thing for us to, to acknowledge in our life, in our walk with Christ, is that that all of us struggle with this area. Now, Christ is bringing this out, and he says, beware of it. Uh, Christ doesn't say, you, you cannot be a hypocrite and be a believer in me. What he says is, this. he says, beware of this hypocrite. You have to understand that once it takes hold, it's a very dangerous thing, and it can um, lead into a, a total corruption of, of the life. Now, we don't want to be a hypocrite at all. That's not what I'm saying, okay? But, but we also understand sometimes that in this conversation that I talk, talked about a moment ago, sometimes it goes that way. We're not even aware that it goes that way. And then maybe later on, you know, the Holy Spirit, God brings it to our mind of what we've done. And so our goal is to not be a hypocrite at all. Um, these Pharisees were being that. They were teaching one thing, they were living something else, and they were portraying that, um, that they were what they were teaching. You may have heard the statement that uh, people will make, and, and most of the time it's an excuse to not come to church, but they'll make the statement, you know, I don't want to go there because it's just all hypocrites in there. Well, you're right, it is. <laughs> but so are you. <laughs> you know, what's different? Um, and they go to Walmart, and there's a bunch of hypocrites in Walmart too, but they, it doesn't bother them to go there, you know. Um, it, it's, it's an excuse. And, and the, the difference would be that hopefully as we walk into church, and, and not just when we're in church, but the people that come to church hopefully would identify, look, I have messed up, and, and acknowledge that, that we are sinful. And, and I think that is the difference, and we, we can't live that life to make people think that we're perfect, because we're not. And, and if we portray that, then we're getting close on that borderline of, of this hypocrisy thing. And that doesn't mean that we run out and tell everybody everything that we do wrong either, but, but we just don't present ourselves as we have everything exactly right in our life. And, and Christ is, is cautioning about this very thing. Uh, question three, why would Jesus compare hypocrisy to yeast? talked a little bit about that is slow moving um, so if, if we don't keep that under control it slowly again takes over the inside and it'll and it begins just like yeast does to bread and it, it makes it rise or puff up whatever you want to call that uh, it will do to us and it will make us a puffed up individual that views ourselves as doing nothing wrong but looks down on everyone else for the things that they're doing in life any questions on that at all? The fourth question kind of, uh, we'll move on from hypocrisy after this fourth one, but it says, why do you think that we have a tendency to be a hypocrite? So why do you think that that is something that, um, that we struggle with? 
especially maybe younger in our life. Shame. Shame. Um, and, and a lot of times it's shame like in front of other people. So we're afraid of what they think of us maybe. And so we, we put on that face um, or mask. I think it, we have a fear of what others would think. Um, we have a fear of what others may say if they know who we really are. You know, probably one of the first times that we were a hypocrite was actually in front of our parents. Not, not talking about the relationship with God, but, but just looking at earthly relationships. Probably one of the first times was, was with our parents, and we pretended to be someone that we weren't because we probably done whatever they knew we had done. We had probably done it at school, but we're saying, oh, no, we, well, I didn't do that. And uh, that's probably one of the first times that we were. Many, many times we'll uh, get into a conversation and somebody's name comes up. You'll say, you know what they did? And, and it goes from there like I'm just pure as white snow. And look what this sorry guy did. Mm. And, uh, that's wrong of us wrong with us and um, you know there is there is nothing wrong with accountability between individuals so if you walked up to me and said you know I, I, you know, I hear you got some things going on in your life I just want to talk to you because I, I care about you nothing wrong with that that's that's an accountability thing that we all need at some point in time now obviously you got to word that right okay well there's nothing wrong with that but do I I get punched you in might the nose. Might get punched in the nose. It, it's got to be the right situation. But um, but for me to walk up to Don and talk about Bill and say, you know, like you said, I mean, that's a completely different situation. So there's nothing wrong with us like knowing those things as long as we use them in the right way and we use them for a positive result, whereas if we're just talking about someone else, it's it's a negative thing. And, and typically what we're doing is we're trying to bring the other person down to make ourselves look better. That's typically the way that works. So, um, What's the old saying? If you can't say something good, don't say nothing at all. Yeah. We have a lot of talking going on really, in the world. Um, you know, this, this fear of how others view us, is, um, is something that overtakes us a lot of times. And, and we see this displayed in a lot of different areas. And, and don't take this the wrong way, I'm just using an example, but, but we're concerned about what people think about the way we dress. We're concerned about what people think about the way our hair looks or what kind of clothes we wear or, you know, as younger, maybe as we get older, we don't worry about that as much. But, but then we, we also, at some points, become concerned about um, what others think about the way our yard looks or about the way our house looks. Um, I dare say that most of us don't invite someone over without kind of doing a, at least a walk through of the house, touch up, yeah. Um, you know, we have, we have all these concerns about what others, um, but then do we, do we have that same concern for what God knows about us. Because this, this next question, question five, you know, reputation and character. And I think we talked about this a little bit last week, reputation and character. But, you know, reputation is what others see us as. Um, character is what God knows about us. And, and um, I wonder if we have as much concern about character, about what God knows, as we do about reputation or how other people see us. And I think that is a struggle, even in the, the church of today. I think that is a struggle that goes on. And, and you know, Christ kind of calls that out. He's, he says, don't fear the one that can just kill the body, but fear the one that can kill the body and then cast into hell. And he's talking about his heavenly father, or he's talking about himself, really, because he's the, the rightful judge of that. But, but um, he says, don't worry about you know, what people are thinking. Because if, if we worry about what God knows, then we don't have to worry about what people think because all that's going to be took care of. And people are going to see us as an individual that, that has a heart after God. You know, kind of like what David, 
man after God's own heart, people will see us as that individual. And even in our mistakes, when they see us as that individual, it takes a different light um, because people tend to be a little more forgiving than that when they see that our heart is truly uh, trying to, to go after God. All right, question six. What's the best way to avoid hypocrisy? Probably one of the hardest things, especially for some to do. And that is to forget what people think and to only fear what God thinks. And, and it's a respectful fear, again. You know, I think we've talked through that a few times. But, but it's just to forget what people think and, and let's go with what God thinks. And, and just to use kind of, um, to use the way that we dress as an example, uh, when we worry about what God thinks, this whole modesty of dress completely works itself out. But when we worry about what people think, that's when the modesty issues start showing up because we have this, this desire to dress like the rest of the world. But when we worry about what God, or we fear what God knows about us, then, then that modesty takes over, and there's no, there's no concern with that. All right, question seven. When we truly understand who God is, why is it more logical, plus just the right thing to do, to fear God above everything else? So when we truly understand who God is, why is it more logical to fear God above everything else? Christ gives us that answer in uh, verse 5. I said it actually a minute ago. Because God can, God can cast the soul to hell. Um, it's the right thing to do to fear God, but, but it's even more logical because I mean, when we think about eternity, man can do nothing. So it's more logical even to just think about what God, what God's uh, view of our life is, and it's just the right thing. He could say, "God has the final say." In it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, let's flip over to Second Timothy chapter two, if you would, in your Bible. Second Timothy chapter two, starting in verse eight. And the question is, what does Second Timothy two, eight through nineteen, tell us about our relationship with God and our relationship with man? So Second Timothy chapter two, verse eight. And this would be Paul writing to Timothy. So this is directed at him. And Paul makes a statement, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. So Paul just reminds Timothy, look, it's because I'm speaking of Jesus Christ, because I'm living my life for him, that's the reason that I'm bound up right now. I'm in prison. Uh, but the word of God is not bound. So even though physically Paul was tied up in prison, the word of God is not bound by that. And it goes, it goes on. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I mean, God is faithful. And he can't, he can't move away from that. That's just who he is. And so he's, he can't deny it. Uh, he's always going to be that. And then verse 14 
Remind them of these things and charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hermenius, Hermenius, sorry, and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So what does this tell us about our relationship with God and our relationship with man? So what's something you, you see out of those verses concerning our relationship with God? He's faithful to us even though sometimes we're not faithful. That's right. He's faithful to us even in our failures to be that. And then from our side, if you look down um, to verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So uh, God is faithful to us. We are to rightly handle this word of truth. As, and if you notice those verses around, Paul's talking about how we interact with other people. We're to rightly handle the word of truth as we interact with other people. And he does so by talking about, you know, the irreverent babbling. There's no need in that going on. But, uh, but when we rightly handle the word of truth, then we speak truth. And, and that's what's relayed. It's not irreverent babble, but it's important truth that goes to people. Uh, the quarreling about words, it, it does no good. Um, so... We just see the faithfulness of God to us, and we see in return then that we uh, should rightly handle the truth that he's given us so that we relay that to other people. Going back to Luke chapter 12, uh, question 9, it says, what does Christ mean in verse 10 by saying, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven? Chapter 12, verse 10. And this is uh, where that, that term, the unpardonable sin, this is the, the scripture reference that that comes from. So what does, what does Christ mean by saying whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven? And I, I want to just throw this out there. There are several interpretations of this. So... Uh, There's a good chance you've heard multiple things in your life, maybe, concerning it. One of the um, one of the things that's always good to do whenever we study scriptures to look at the context in, into which it's being spoken. So, to remind ourselves, Christ is speaking to this group of of um, First, his apostles, the twelve, but then just this large group of thousands that have, have been following him. So this is the context. Now, this, this audience would not be Gentile. They would be Jew. So he's speaking to a Jewish audience, uh, very large, but speaking to his twelve and then to, to the group. As Christ makes this statement... Um, he is in the midst of his ministry here on earth. There is one that was sent before him, who I believe at this point has already been beheaded, uh, which was who? The John the Baptist. Okay, so there's a, there's a line of thought that Christ was speaking into this Jewish group, and he was saying that 
as Jews, and, and understand when we say Jews, we're not talking about every single Jew. We're just talking about as a, as a group, just to, to talk about them. That as, as a group, the Jews had rejected God when they rejected John the Baptist. Christ knew what, where he was headed at this point in time. He was on his way to Jerusalem. He knew what was going to happen when he got to Jerusalem. He was going to be celebrated, and then he was going to be arrested, and then he was going to be crucified. So Christ knew that the Jews were going to reject him in front of Pilate when they called for his crucifixion. So you've got the rejection of God through John the Baptist. You've got the rejection of Christ that would happen shortly after this. Christ also looks ahead, and he sees after his resurrection and his ascension, when he had promised to the apostles that the Comforter would come, the Holy Spirit would come, Christ also looks to that point in time when the apostles would preach, as recorded in Acts, and he sees that the Jewish nation as a whole, again, would reject the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's role is to remind us of Christ or to reveal Christ in our, in, uh, to us. So there's a line of thought that Christ is addressing this pattern that we see occurring. Rejection of God, rejection of Christ, the last thing that, that, um, that would be sent by God to try and, um, I'm going to say and understand this correctly when I say it, to try and woo people to believe is the Holy Spirit coming. And when they reject that, there's nothing else coming after that. So this would be like the, the unpardonable is you've rejected the first two, here's the third, and you've rejected it. That's one line of thought into this. And, and I think it holds some merit because it is the, that's the audience he's speaking into um, and it is the, the facts of what happened. Now there's also uh, the line of thought of, okay, how does that affect us in our life then? Because we weren't there when John the Baptist was beheaded. We weren't there when, when Jesus was crucified. And I'm talking about physically. And we weren't physically there when, when the apostles you know, spoke the word. So how does that affect us today? Well, the Holy Spirit's still here ministering upon your within people. So um, the Holy Spirit works today to bring uh, us to a point of, of truth or knowledge to where we would accept Jesus Christ as the only way, the truth, the light, um, salvation, basically. So um, the question then comes, so how do we apply this today? How do we apply this unpardonable today? And, and he identifies it here by saying blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. Well, and if you back up, it, it appears as though he's saying that you can talk bad. I'm going to use this in today's language, okay? You can talk bad about me as, as son of God. You can talk bad about me, and that'll all be fine. But if you talk bad about the Holy Spirit, then that's not, that's not acceptable. It's what it appears if you just kind of take that glance. I don't think that's what he was really meaning. What I think he was meaning was the Holy Spirit is here to tell you of Christ. But if you reject what the Holy Spirit is telling you of Christ, then you're also rejecting Christ. So, now, we know that, that God shows great patience to us as we go throughout our life. Some accept Christ at an early age. Uh, some of us are more stubborn, and it takes a little while for it to happen. We ultimately know, and this gets down to... Uh, well, I didn't put it on here. What did... There's a point in time when we know that uh, the unpardonable sin can be committed. And the, the only time that we can actually, I think, confidently say that we know is if someone dies and has not accepted Christ, then that unpardonable sin has been committed because they rejected the Holy Spirit, which means they rejected Christ. They didn't become a believer before they left this earth, and therefore it's too late for them to make that decision. That's the point in time I think that we can confidently say the unpardonable sin has been committed. Can it be committed before that? I'm not going to say it can't. I don't know, though. And I don't know where that line is. I don't think any of us do. 
I think that's what's so hard about this unpardonable sin. I think, though, that as believers, if we have this knowledge of this unpardonable sin, and it's a concern for us in our life, and, and by concern I don't mean that we worry about it every day. I just mean that like we have this knowledge and, we, and, and in our, our life we think, you know, I want to listen to what God has to say because I don't want to commit that, that unpardonable sin. Then I think that's a healthy fear of God, which then will prevent us from committing the unpardonable sin because we will be attentive to what, what God will be directing us to do and not do through the Holy Spirit. If we get to a point in our life where we just say, you know, I'm going to do this on my own, not going to pray about it. I'm not going to listen. You know, I'm just going to. I'm going at life myself. I think we're in a dangerous area, and you know, does that unpardonable sin get committed? We don't know. We're not the judge of that. The only time I think we can say it is if no one is, if they haven't been saved, and they didn't before they took their last breath. Then I think at that point we know the unpardonable sin's been committed. Um, and that follows suit with what Christ was saying to this Jewish nation. That I sent you John the Baptist. I sent you my son. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And if you reject him, then it, there's nothing left. You're, you're done. You've rejected him. Which means you've rejected Christ, which then means you've rejected God. Any thoughts or, or comments about that? Let me say, too, um, going back to the reference to the Jewish nation, when they rejected John the Baptist, could they have been forgiven after that? Yeah, yeah I mean, obviously Christ came, so, you know, he, uh, he was there. They rejected Christ. They asked Pilate to crucify him. Could they be forgiven after that? Peter also rejected Christ. Peter did. You might remember what Christ prayed when he hung on the cross too. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Which means, you know, why would Christ pray that if there wasn't the opportunity for forgiveness so they could be forgiven? So there's forgiveness available after, in, and I'm talking from a Jewish nation perspective here, there's forgiveness offered after rejection of John the Baptist, forgiveness offered after rejection of Christ. What about after rejection of the Holy Spirit? Nothing else. Nothing else there. It doesn't appear that there's nothing else there, which means rejection of the Holy Spirit then would be unpardonable because there's nothing, no, no other opportunity after that. Now, when does that rejection occur? That's what we don't know. And thankfully, it's in God's hands, not ours. Um, looking at, at um, well, I did have it on there. Question ten: What do we know for sure? What, what do we know for sure is the unpardonable sin? That would be just the rejection of the final rejection of Christ. Um, if you want to look at a verse for that, John three thirty six is a place you can kind of look at. That um, I'll just flip over there real quick. John 3.36 actually says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So basically, if you reject the Holy Spirit, you're rejecting Christ, which means you're not being obedient to Christ. Therefore, the wrath of God is upon him. And then according to John 16.7-15, what does the Spirit bear witness about? Um, We talked about this a little bit. It, it bears witness about, and I'm going to let you look up that reference. To, it bears witness about Jesus Christ. And the way that we treat the Spirit is actually the way we treat Christ. Um, so, and, and maybe sometimes we think about this not being, we don't think about the ramifications of us not being obedient to the Spirit. But the Spirit actually brings us to an understanding of what Christ is and then what he would guide us to do. So when we reject the Holy Spirit, and, and by reject, I don't mean that we just say that's not real. I mean when we just 
don't be obedient to the Holy Spirit, then we're also not being obedient to Christ, which is why we use those terms interchangeably a lot of times. Like you've heard ministers probably say, you know, let's be obedient to Christ or obedient to the Holy Spirit, kind of the same thing. But the way we treat the Holy Spirit is the way we treat Christ. And some people, if they thought of it in terms of I'm treating Christ this way, might not act in the same way that they do when they're just thinking that it's the Holy Spirit leading them that way. Um, but to reject one is to reject all. To be disobedient to one is to be disobedient to all. And I'm talking about the Trinity when I say that. All right, what leads, I'm sorry, no? No. Uh, what leads someone to be saved or to believe in Jesus Christ, and that's the Spirit revealing Christ to them. I mean, that's, that's part of the role of the Holy Spirit in our, and then what's in, indwelled within us, that Holy Spirit guides us daily and reminds us of all that Christ taught in our life, or all that he taught that would apply to our life. And then that last uh, little statement there, how many pieces of paper do we have left? Um, I have one. You do. And there's coming a day, and let me, let me kind of give you some backstory for this. Um, I read an illustration by Tony Evans. Some of you know, know who he is, may not. He's a, um, I believe, Southern Baptist minister. He's a very good speaker, if you ever have a chance to hear him, hear him speak. He's uh, African-American, but he, he does a, he's a very good speaker. And he, uh, I've heard him at a couple different conferences. Um, he and his daughter actually spoke together one time and done an excellent job. But he has, he's very good at storytelling. So he can take an illustration, and, and I mean, he can just really well. So I read a lot of his illustrations just because they're, they're good, and I'm not very good with them, so it, it helps. But he was telling them, he was taking the, uh, the illustration of a stack of paper, and he said that um, we all have determined somewhat by science today, but in the Bible we were all uh, kind of given this, this uh, expected lifespan, so expected life, life number of years. Uh, three score plus ten is what you know, the Bible tells us, which is 70. We know that averages in today's world is somewhere around 72, 73 for, for a male and 75 to, I think, 77 now for a female. But our individual life is, is not determined by an average. It's determined by God. If you take those years and you multiply them out by 365, and you get a number of days. If you were to take a stack of paper that was that number of days thick, every day that you lived your life, you'd be taking a piece of paper off. Eventually, you'd get down to one piece. You're holding one piece of paper in your hand right now. What if that was your last day? And would what we've talked about today affect you in a different way if you knew that that piece of paper was your last, or that was your last day here on earth. And we should always have that thought when we approach scripture that, that this is, it, it's immediate, that the change that I need to make in my life is immediate, if there's a change needed. And so as Christ talks to us about stuff in our life, and I just kind of wrote that down, how many pieces of paper do we have left? Just as a reminder of there's a, there's a need for us to be urgent in what we do because we never know if we're on 10 pieces of paper or one you know, maybe it's 10,000 I mean we, we don't know we don't know how many days there are but there's a need for us to to consider it as though there's one so as you leave here today take that one piece of paper with you stay in your Bible if you want whatever let it be a reminder though that we don't know the number of days we should live with the urgency that this may be the last 
and therefore as God speaks, we need to be obedient to listen. Any questions or thoughts before we close? Comments? Complaints, I guess. <laughs> All right, let's, yes, ma'am. I need to add one more to our prayer list. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Brian, you know what? Uh, he's a nephew by marriage, but they've called him hospice. He's uh, 53 and has three girls still at home. And uh, it's just a hard situation. He has cancer. Where's he from? Let's, uh, let's stand together and let's close in a word of prayer today. I do appreciate you all coming and your tentatives today. And, um, as always, if, if I can be of any assistance, you don't hesitate to give me a call. I'd be glad to do.